Rob is uh, another one of the not sufficiently known treasures, a uh, <laughs> Canadian literary figure of some renown, easily Canada's most significant sci-fi writer, and uh, why I thought to have him here at this time, he's spoken at Idea City before, is he's just published a novel called Rollback, and um, without giving away too much of the plot, um, it's about a couple who in their advanced years are offered the possibility of an age rollback. Uh, a new device has been discovered, but it's new, it's not infallible, they agree to proceed and the procedure works in the case of one of them and it doesn't in the case of the other. Interesting story. Robert? Thank you, Moses. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, thank you. As Moses mentioned, I'm a science fiction writer, and I want to make a distinction between science fiction and fantasy at the outset. Science fiction is about things that plausibly might happen. Fantasy is about things that never could happen. And the way that a science fiction writer deals with what plausibly might happen is through a process called extrapolation, which means we start in the past, look at what's come to date, and then try and reasonably project forward. So to talk a little bit about this theme, this, this module here, which is about aging, I want to go back actually quite a bit into the ancient past. Moses mentioned my novel, Rollback. That's true, I did write that book. Uh, probably my most famous novel is a novel called Hominids, which won the Hugo Award, the top award in the science fiction industry, uh, and it dealt with Neanderthals and us, and why we're here and Neanderthals aren't here. And one of the reasons that we're here and they aren't here is that we invented some things that they didn't invent. On a kind of prosaic basis, we invented projectile weapons and spears that you throw. They only used thrusting spears, which meant you had to get in very close quarters with the animals you were going to kill, and that was a very high mortality rate for a Neanderthal hunter. We made progress and eliminated that difficulty. But that's not, I think, the reason that we survived ultimately than they did not. Now, I know recent evidence shows that we crossbred with Neanderthals and that they, we subsumed some of their DNA into our own. That's true, but they are gone as a culturally distinct group. Why are they gone? Why are we still here? There's been a lot of reference to the fact that only in the last century, maybe century and a half, have we seen any appreciable progress in human aging? That's kind of sort of true, but it's not the entire story. Uh, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens sapiens, us, coexisted until about 28,000 years ago. And then something happened and they disappeared and we, we uh, endured. And one of the things that some anthropologists, paleoanthropologists argue that happened is this. Our lifespan got just a little bit longer than theirs. We went from having the same average lifespan they had, which was about 28 years, to having a lifespan of 30 or 31 or 32 years. In other words, we invented old age. And when we invented old age, there was an absolute sea change in society because you went from having simply parents and children, two generations extant at a given time, to parents, children, but also the parents' parents. The grandparents extant. You had three generations extant at a single time. Granted, not a lot of overlap. We were only living long enough that there was a few years of overlap, but it radically changed the way society was structured. It allowed, for instance, for specialization of labor. Instead of the adults being consumed with looking after the next generation, the previous generation, the grandparents, could help out with that, and you allowed for diversification and people to do things that they can't, couldn't otherwise have done with their time, which was one wonderful thing. The other thing was we were, as were all people at that time, we heard, of course, in an earlier talk that agriculture wasn't invented until 11,000 some hundred years ago, which is true. Uh, Neanderthals disappeared 28,000 years ago. There were no agriculturalists in the world at this time. Everybody was a hunter-gatherer, and hunter-gathering depends on something else that we associate with old age. That is wisdom. It depends on accumulated life experience being able to guide you in predicting what your future actions should be. 
so that if you start living longer and longer, you see more and more patterns in migrations of animals, in the way that uh, uh, plants uh, respond to a, a dry season as opposed to a wet season and so forth. The more experience you have, the better you're able to predict, okay, it was a really dry winter, we should move over here for the summer. It was a really wet winter, we can stay here. And a few additional years of accumulated Wisdom is one of the reasons that we're here today. So I think a very positive message that I want to leave you with is that aging has not, in fact, been a bad thing for the human race. It, in fact, has been the defining characteristic of why we and all the other kinds of genus Homo, no, uh, we all, alone among all the kinds of genus Homo that ever existed, are extant to this day, are still in existence, is because we learn to age a little bit more. And then that's absolutely right. As we've heard from some other speakers, we stalled for a long period of time. There was an extended period where the lifespan of human beings stayed about the same. Now, you have to be careful about these statistics because you always have to ask yourself whether infant mortality is being factored into the age. When you say the average age is very low, well, yes, because you're losing nine out of 10 children before they're five years old, of course the average is gonna be low. We heard the example earlier today of Sophocles, my favorite playwright, he wrote Oedipus Rex, uh, who lived to be 90 years old 2,000 years ago. Of course, these kinds of ages that we're, we're aware of today uh, as being good hail ages did exist in classical times as well. The only difference is more and more people are achieving those ages. Will we go beyond that biblical three score and 10? Will we go beyond the 124 years as we've seen the oldest human being has managed to be? Uh, any time in the near future. My position is yes, that we are going to do that, that radical hu human life prolongation is in the cards. It's something that's gonna happen this century. Now, this century is a scary thing for those of us who are already halfway through our own personal century at this point, but for people who are born today, who are born here in the second decade of the 21st century, the likelihood that they're going to see the 23rd century, well, you would be mean-spirited to say they're not going to live to be in their 90s, right? The chance that they're going to live to see the 24th century as well, which is, to put it all in good science fictional terms, 23rd century is Star Trek, the original series, 24th century is Star Trek, the next generation. <laughs> so. The fact is that people alive today may very well live long enough to see Captain Jean-Luc Picard and get to ask him why a Frenchman has a British accent in the 24th century. <laughs> This is all reasonably plausible because of the incredible rapidity with which we are solving scientific conundrums related to aging. Uh, Aubrey de Grey, who is a, a great senescence theorist, uh, will talk about the seven factors that contribute to aging. We have the laundry list of what goes wrong with our bodies, and all we have to do is come up with the right ways to deal with those seven factors to get us to live for longer lives. And I don't want to bog us down into what those miracle processes might be. Some are gene therapy, some are perhaps nanotechnology, some are uh, simply finding chemical things that'll clear out the junk that accumulates within our cells and between our cells and in the neural tissue of our brain. Uh, you can look up that laundry list yourself online. What I want to talk about a little bit in the time I have remaining is uh, what this is going to mean from a societal point of view. I talked about how it was an absolute game changer for us 20 odd thousand years ago when we started living a little longer than the, com the competition was living and started having a slightly longer perspective and it enabled us to be better hunters and gatherers. The single biggest problem that faces us today as a species is not our individual mortality but is the potential mortality of our entire species and of this planet. That is, all of this talk about life prolongation does us no good whatsoever if we have a severe ecological collapse, or if we have an absolute nuclear holocaust, or a biological holocaust, or uh, if we're unprepared for when another asteroid slams into the Earth as the one that did at uh, Shiksalub 65 million years ago did and wiped out the dinosaurs uh, through severe climate change, or if we don't control climate change, any of these things might be more likely to cause a failure in that scenario I put forth. That is, that somebody just born today will live long enough to ask Jean-Luc Picard how come baldness hasn't been cured by the 24th century. <laughs> is not that we won't be able to make them live that long, but the whole world might not live that long. And why is it that these two questions of aging, 
the longevity of an individual and the longevity of a, of a civilization are related. Well, they're related, I think, in a very uh, straightforward Darwinian sense, all right? Darwin uh, gave us the uh, explanation of why we are here today, which is uh, natural selection. And natural selection uh, has, has many engines involved in it, but one of them is kin selection. You preferentially benefit your closest relatives so that they will survive with copies of your genes, even if you will not uh, yourself. Because all evolution cares about is how many copies of those genes are out there, not how many individuals, uh, not any particular individual. It's very much gene selection is the level of natural selection. So that if you're having a, a situation where you're having to decide who's going to be saved, your son or your brother's son, who do you save? Darwin says you save your son because he has half your DNA, your brother's son has a quarter of your DNA. You don't save your brother's son. If I were to say to any of you in the audience here that your second cousin, once removed, is in dire financial straits, isn't going to meet his or her rent this coming uh, first of the month. How many of you are immediately reaching for your wallet? Well, I can see not a one of you is. In fact, most of you are scratching your heads trying to ask yourself, who is your second cousin once removed, right? Well, your second cousin once removed is a person who has 1 64th of your DNA. The Darwinian engine has programmed you to not be particularly concerned about your second cousin once removed. But the reality is that as every time a new generation passes, you cut the DNA that you share with the preceding generation in half. You go six generations into the future, which at modern day generation kind of times is about 200 years, and you're down to that same level of dilution. You're down to 1 64th. So yes, of course, we care about what's gonna to happen to our children, and we provide for them with our wills and uh, leave an estate, perhaps, and so forth, and certainly have tried to make the world a better place for the few decades that they're going to live beyond what we're going to live. Do we care that much about our grandchildren? Yes, we might indeed. Perhaps we've met our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our great-great-grandchildren, our great-great-great. The farther down you go this chain, the less Darwin tells you to be invested in what happens to those entities. And so by the time you get to that level of being as disinterested and what happens to them, as you are, all of us are, into what happens to our second cousins once removed, you only have to go 200 years in the future at the rate at which we replace generations. And that means we are hardwired genetically not to think about the long-term health of the planet. We don't think about climate change. One of the reasons we don't think about it is we don't live long enough to really see climate change. We talk about, oh, I, I grew up here in Toronto, and yes, there used to be more snow in winter than there is now, but you can argue, well, Toronto was a lot smaller then. It didn't give off as much heat as it gives off now. It's now a big, hot city, of course, and so you can, dis you can dismiss it and say it's not really happening. If I had lived for those 200 years, instead of relying on somebody six generations removed from me being 200 years down the road, not only would I have perspective, but I would have a vested interest. And so life prolongation, I think, is going to be wonderfully important for the long-term survival of the species. As soon as we start thinking in horizons that are longer than just our kids and maybe ourselves, uh, sorry, just ourselves and maybe our kids, we start looking at the possibility of this society, this civilization, enduring, long enduring, as Abraham Lincoln would say, uh, despite all of the possible threats against it. We become very much having a vested interest in the future. Instead of the 24th century seeming like a ridiculously far future uh, notion, it's where we're going to be retiring in or where our kids are going to be retiring in and we should prepare for that. I was, this is so foreign to most of us. We have such short time frames that we think in. I was hired a couple of years ago by a big pharmaceutical company to come in and give a, a, a keynote address to uh, them in their vaccine division. And you say, why, why is a science fiction writer coming to talk to people who do vaccines? And the answer was this. The vaccine division deals with projects that last longer than a normal career. It takes 20 
took 30 years to bring a new vaccine actually to market. Most people who work on a vaccine come in at some point in the development cycle where it's already begun and leave. They either retire or move on to some other kind of vocation before it is finished. And there's an enormous difficulty with motivation of these people because the project is bigger than them. We're hardwired to think in terms of careers that are a couple of decades and lifespans that are uh, uh, 10 decades or fewer. And this really demoralizes us and makes it incapable for us to do the kind of long-term thinking that we need to do. Uh, I think when we start routinely seeing people living uh, 100 and then 120, then 150, then 200, and then onward, we're going to see a real fundamental change in the human approach to long-term thinking, and that will be all to the good. Uh, what we need to do now, we, uh, I think Matt Ridley observed that right now, human lifespan is advancing by about three months for every year. At some point, it's gonna be four months, five months, six months for every year, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and then you hit uh, a key point where it becomes 13 months for every year, where the lifespan starts uh, developing uh, longer than the amount of time that you've uh, uh, lived additionally, so that you have what Aubrey de Grey, again, the senescent theorist, calls escape velocity. You suddenly are outrunning aging. We don't have to invent the capability to solve aging on a long-term basis, we only have to successively do it on a series of short-term bases. As long as you're keeping ahead, as long as the average life expectancy is rising by more than one year for every calendar year that passes, you have a treadmill towards immortality. And many of us would like to be on that. What would we do if we had all that time? Uh, I, when I was young, I was 25 years old, CBC Radio, very kindly, gave me some money uh, to go and interview science fiction writers, interviewed many of my idols. And one of the ones I interviewed was Judith Merrill, the, great late, the late great Judith Merrill, American science fiction editor who relocated here to Canada, peace activist, wonderful lady. And I said to her, here I was, 25 years old, uh, holding my microphone out to her, but you write about immortality, wouldn't that be boring? And she was in her 70s at that point, and she looked at me and she said, only somebody in their 20s could think that living forever would be boring. Here I am near the end of my life, she said, and there are so many things that I never got to do that I want to do, and so many new things being invented for me to do, that there's this endless list. Your bucket list becomes like the expanding universe as you get older, bigger and bigger, more and more things that you want to do. Amongst the things that we might do realistically is, especially if we keep breeding on this planet, which we probably will, we like procreating, we like having multi-generations, is we will finally start moving out into space. We will have to move out into space because space has a lot of space, hence the name. There's a desire to want to have territory to live in. And we will certainly see people starting to live in orbital colonies, on the moon, on Mars. Mars has the same dry land surface area that Earth has, and only one-third the gravity that Earth has. If you're feeling kind of dragged down by uh, your existence here on Earth, you might find a very sprightly retirement uh, living somewhere on the, uh, uh, in the uh, foothills of Olympus Mons on Mars, and there's great skiing there, too. So, realistically, I think we are going to extend the human lifespan, it's what saved us initially as a species. It's why we're here today, is because we learned to live longer, take advantage of the wisdom that that longer life gave us. It's what pushed us to this plateau where now, today, we understand all of the reasons why we do age, we have the laundry list, and we're starting to chip away at each and every one of them. There only are seven or eight. And we will, in this century, and hopefully in the next couple of decades, and if we're really lucky, in the lifespan of every one of us in this room, get to that escape velocity moment where we're living more than one year of additional life for each calendar year that passes. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a picture. Ah, picture. Yeah. The picture. Okay. Thank you. One more. That's great. Thank you. Right. So. Your name, your name tag. Oh, my handler has my name oh. tag. Yeah. If you'll grab her, she said she would give it to me. So we have to be back here for Idea City 2050. That's right. You and me both. You and I. Yes. It's a date. It's a deal. Absolutely.
And you're all committed to being here yourselves? So may I suggest you buy your tickets in advance and save a little money? Thank you. Thank you so much.